Protein synthesis or gene expression is the process by which the code that's the genotype stored in DNA becomes the phenotype, which is basically proteins in the organisms of life. Proteins have fulfilled so many different roles, including immune response, regulation, recognition, transport, movement, structure, enzymatic catalysis, storage for future use, and a lot of other things. And it's through the action of mediary molecules such as proteins themselves and RNA, especially RNA, that this process is possible. Proteins are of course polypeptides or long chains of amino acids bound together by peptide bonds, which are those connections that form when a hydrogen is removed and a hydroxide is removed from two adjacent amino acids and leaving making water in the process. It's called dehydration synthesis and it's similar to what bonds other micromolecules in life as well. An amino acid has a central carbon surrounded by a hydrogen, a side chain, an amino group, and a carboxyl group. In humans, there are 20 different kinds of amino acids with different kinds of side chains, which is what makes the difference between them. And in nature, however, you can have between 20 and 25 depending on the organism, and it is possible to synthesize up to 39 different kinds of amino acids, which are mirror images of the amino acids which show up naturally. And scientists have been exploring using these synthesized amino acids to actually enhance proteins and make new kinds of proteins for purposes such as medical applications. Proteins are definitely the most diverse molecule of life. They have way more monomers than any of the other macromolecules. For example, carbohydrates only have three, lipids like triglycerides have glycerol and fatty acid chains, and nucleic acids have the nucleotides, which can be four out of five different variations, depending if you are RNA or DNA, you may have thymine or uracil, that's why it's four out of five, but all of them have adenine, guanine, and cytosine. But either way, clearly, it is proteins which are, have the the key for the variety of life. They have a lot more kinds of monomers which allows them to build a lot of different kinds of structures. Just kind of like building words in an alphabet, you can make thousands of different kinds of structures by making proteins of different lengths and using different amino acids strung in different sequences. Protein structure has four levels of organization. Primary structure is basically the polypeptide chain. And based on the primary structure and attraction between the side chains of amino acids, you're going to find the secondary structure of proteins, which is held together by hydrogen bonds, in the same way the primary structure is held together by peptide bonds. Now, hydrogen bonds are not actual bonds. They're more like intermolecule attraction forces or van der Waal forces. But those attraction forces are enough to create structures like alpha helix, which is like a coil, or a beta sheet. Put together those different kinds of structures in a long, long strand that calls upon itself in a, what it seems a chaotic way, and you get what is called a subunit or the tertiary structure of proteins, which is held together by more hydrogen bonds and disulfide bridges. Now, some of them are just that, tertiary structures, and the majority of enzymes are like that, and they're globular in shape, although some proteins are going to be fibrous in shape and be more like hair, which has different strands of proteins kind of call upon themselves. But, some proteins actually put together these tertiary units into larger quaternary units, which are basically kind of like multiple proteins in one protein. And we call it that a quaternary structure, filled with different domains or parts with different functions. And the more you, functions you add or more domains you add, the more variety you add to the protein. DNA may have those four nucleotides but arranged in different sequences and you actually compare the structure of DNA to the structure of proteins and you see there's a lot more structural variety within proteins than within DNA. It's proteins that make everything you are but it's DNA that contains the code to make all those proteins and that is why DNA is considered the basic Mendelian factor of, the, of inheritance. Remember that at some point there was contention because of the diversity of proteins and because of the abundance and because chromosomes are 90% made of proteins, there was, some, there was some contention about which one of the molecules were the genetic factor of Mendel. But after studies such as the Avery and Hershey and Chase studies, which were performed in the earlier 20th century, we figured out that, in fact, genetic material was DNA. And then, with Chargraff, Rosalind Franklin, Watson and Crick, and many other scientists contributed to the understanding of the structure of the DNA molecule. And other scientists like Mort and Stuart Vant worked together to actually understand how DNA coils itself up in chromosomes, and how does that determine some of the inheritance patterns that we see in life. But one thing is for sure, DNA contains all the genes in your body, structure in a long sequence with 
little bit of junk DNA in between. That junk DNA includes things like regulatory sequences, short tendon repeats, genes which are now defunct and no longer functional, and a lot of other things which are stored still in the DNA code. But the point is, DNA contains several genes, and each one of these genes have the potential to become one protein if it undergoes gene expression. Now, the th interesting thing is actually that we figured out that because sometimes proteins are built of different domains or smaller subunits to make a one larger multiple protein, it's possible that many genes are actually necessary to make one protein. So the modern idea of genetics is that, in fact, it's not the whole one gene equals one protein, but more like many genes can sometimes build one protein. And even the gene itself has a bunch of junk DNA in between it. Remember, each transcription unit of the DNA will have a lot of introns or things which are not actually coding for proteins. And whether you remove or not those introns is going to determine which kind of protein you actually make. And so there's a lot more complicated than we earlier anticipated. But one thing is for sure, proteins are made based on DNA. DNA and RNA are two different kinds of nucleic acids which are going to be involved in this process. DNA is double-stranded, has deoxyribose and thymine. And RNA has uracil instead of thymine, ribose instead of deoxyribose, and is single-stranded. DNA has all the genes, RNA is a copy of a single gene. DNA will be like the mainframe, RNA will be having multiple jobs in the process of synthesis. And we'll see those jobs as we discuss the process of protein synthesis, which start in the nucleus as the DNA code is transcribed into RNA. And then that code gets processed and access the nucleus, finds a ribosome, which then with the help of transfer RNA bringing in the amino acids, will actually translate the code into a different kind of molecule now called a protein, which sometimes also undergoes post-translational modifications. This whole process is determined by the code that's inside of DNA, which is a DNA triplet code. You can see here an example of that. A several sequence of nucleotides, three at a time, will help determine the sequence of amino acids that actually show up in the protein. And it kind of works like this. Every three bases stand for a codon in the RNA message. And then that codon of the RNA message gets translated to an actual amino acid and every codon will stand for one amino acid. But there are many types of codons in the body since there's three, a triplet code and for every piece of the triplet there's a one in four chances of using a base since you have adenine, thymine, cytosine and guanine. In DNA therefore there are 64 possible codons because it's four times four times four. And so with 64 codons you can have 64 messages. But since there's only 20 amino acids in the body, plus the message that says stop, we only need 21 messages. But since there's 64, there's going to be some redundancy in the DNA code, which basically means that some codons will stand for the same amino acid as others. Arginine will be coded by CG with any other ending. If whether it ends with U, C, A, or G, all the cases, it will be arginine. And that's what we call the wobble or the fact that there's actually multiple ways to spell each amino acid in within the DNA code. But each code will only spell one amino acid, so the DNA code is specific, even if it is redundant. So you see, this is one of the reasons why it's not always necessarily true that if you change the genetic code, you're going to change the actual phenotype. Because if the mutation happens in the last codon, it's possible that it's going to be a silent mutation. Because it may change the code without changing the actual amino acid it stands for. However, if something like that happens earlier, especially if it happens in the first or second codons, which are not susceptible to that wobble phenomenon, where the last codon is interpreted as the same kind of amino acid, then you could get something like a missense mutation, where you change the protein without necessarily changing the whole protein. And therefore, you make a new protein. Notice, for example, in the example that serine replaces glycine as the last amino acid in the sequence. That's unlikely to actually make the protein completely defective. Another thing that could happen is that a change could happen earlier on and cause the protein to either never start or stop earlier or change so much that it will be incapable of doing its job. That is what we call a nonsense mutation, a mutation that changes the protein so much that it becomes useless. For example, as it happens with hemoglobin in the white blood cells that undergo a point mutation, a substitution on the second codon midway through the process, which changes a normal hemoglobin that has a glutamine at that point to valine. And that causes the cells to have a sickle cell because the hemoglobin will not be built correctly. And it makes the white blood cells less efficiently at carrying actual oxygen throughout the body. But second to chromosome mutations which affect multiple genes, the worst kind of mutation in gene mutations is definitely going to be frame shift mutations. Because the insertion and deletion 
conditions will actually make it more likely for you to shift the reading frame. Basically, look at the right side. If you start copying the DNA from the wrong piece, you actually change the entire codon message and make a completely different protein from what you intended. Frame shift mutations are also going to be more likely to create immediate nonsense and make the protein stop earlier or never start. Sometimes it's possible to get it to cause extensive missense if the mistake happens later in the protein and it changes the amino acid sequence without actually changing the protein too much, but more likely than not it's going to be a problem. And it also it's possible, by the way, to delete an entire codon all at once. So at three deletions in a row. And that means that you know, you're not going to affect the protein sequence completely, but you are going to miss an amino acid somewhere in the middle of the link, and that could change the entire protein as well. So very important to start reading from the right place when you are translating and transcribing. And when we do the protein synthesis review video, we're going to bring this idea back. By the way, you will sometimes get a different kind of code on table when it looks like this. And you start from the center, find the first one. So if you want to do AAA, for example, you go from the A quadrant to the A outer quadrant to the A outer quadrant to find the amino acid that you're talking about. Another interesting thing about the codon code is that it's almost universal across life. The majority of life forms will understand the codon table exactly the same way. That suggests that all life forms on Earth came from the first original life form where this kind of system developed. There are a few exceptions. Some life forms make extra amino acids and therefore they need to use the codons to represent those amino acids and there are going to be some change there. But, for the most part, the majority of life forms understands the codon table the same way, suggesting that we have a common evolutionary ancestor. The exceptions actually prove the rule, because they prove that it's possible to change the model over time. But the fact that we have so much in common, all the life forms are nerf, prokaryotes, eukaryotes alike, and all kinds of eukaryotes, plants, animals, fungus, protists, all of them seem to suggest that we are definitely coming from the same original life form which used the system and it must be a very efficient system because it's been preserved ever since. All of this was discovered by several scientists that worked on the idea of trying to figure out how does the DNA actually generate the phenotype that we see. And one of the first scientists to do that was Archibald Garrett, who looked at Alcoptonuria to discover that some people had a problem because they seemed to have some inborn problems in metabolism. Later on, George Beetle and Boris of Fruzzi studied fruit flies and reached the same conclusion that the problem of the eye color of the mutant fruit fly had something to do with an enzymatic defect in the biochemical pathway that led to generation of color. The same scientist George Beetle worked with another scientist, Edward Tatum, to actually study what would happen if you put a mold that had been mutated into a medium that previously was enough for it to grow, which we call the medium medium. Now the mutated mold did not have all the enzymes that it needed because the DNA was damaged and therefore it was unable to perform the metabolic processes necessary to build amino acids out of that simple nutrient medium. A separate group of scientists redid this experiment, Adrian Serp and Norman Horowitz, to actually figure out the specific biochemical pathway that led to the formation of arginine from the molecules in the, in the medium. And they noticed that it, several mutations could cause the problem. And there was actually, everything was happening in a sequence. And if you, have, if you were missing any of the links of the sequence, any enzyme was defective, the sequence would stop there. And that actually led us to the idea of how to research how gene expression actually worked by simply causing mutations on specific enzymes along the pathway of gene expression. Remove an enzyme from any part of the biochemical pathway and watch where it stops. Repeat this process over and over and figure out exactly the order of things and who's involved in the process. Who are the reactants, who are the products, everything. And at this time, they already knew then that each gene had to do with one enzyme. And eventually, this was also expanded to the idea of one gene, one palate peptide, because of the idea that proteins are not just enzymes, but they have multiple roles in the body. And by nowadays, by the way, we don't even think that anymore because we understand that sometimes it takes multiple genes to make one polypeptide because of the whole split gene or multiple domains in a quaternary protein thing. A different scientist called Marshall Nuremberg actually developed a mechanism to actually discover the code on code that we just talked about. Basically, he t radioactively tagged the amino acids and noticed which transfer RNAs they attached themselves to to figure out the anticodon that paired up with the actual amino acid. And then he used a radioactive filter medium that would block any transfer RNA that was connected to the ribosome, which was waiting for the proper transfer RNA there. 
because they was waiting for a specific transfer RNA that had the proper codon that matched its anticodon. So he would insert a small codon at a time, like for example UUU, and he would keep looking until he found which amino acid would be trapped to the transfer RNA and stuck to the radioactive filter until he figured out that UUU stood for phenylalanine and he repeated this process for every single codon variation there was until he figured out what every single codon stood for in terms of amino acids and he also figured out the wobble by realizing that some codons attracted the same transfer RNA on the radioactive filter carrying the same amino acid as other codons did. So that's the genetic code and the marvelous so that's the genetic code and it's we are just beginning to crack it.